Good morning. Welcome back to Lori's Journey. If this is your first time here, I do videos about my experiences with the Atkins diet. And uh, just a little mis disclaimer here, I'm not a medical professional, so go talk to your doctor or other medical professionals before you do anything that I talk about. But with that, um, it's time to do a little bit more of Dr. Atkins' Diet Revolution by Robert C. Atkins. We are going to be in Chapter 8 today. And the chapter is called, To Stay Fat, Keep on Counting Calories. I don't know about you, but I don't want to stay fat. All right. Um, but before I do get into this, I will say I've been struggling again lately. I don't know why. Just every so often, I just have a hard time keeping on track. And I really need uh, the refresher today. So I don't know about you, but hopefully this will help all of us to uh, get back on track. I'm sorry about the noise in the background. They're doing some work outside my apartment, so hopefully it's not too distracting for you. All right, so chapter eight, to stay fat, keep on counting calories. Earlier in this book, I talked about just how eating less and calorie counting is a trap. It keeps you fat. Look around you. The world is full of fat calorie counters. We're frighteningly locked into the idea that in reducing, it's calories, and only calories, that count. We need to talk more about it. I'm not the first doctor to dispute the calorie theory by any means, but in order to free ourselves of this old and deadly oversimplification, we need to examine still more evidence that the calorie gospel is a hoax. It's such a reflex to think, look, I'm counting calories. I'm a good dieter. I'm bound to lose. The job of this book is to change that reflex into, look, I'm counting carbohydrates because it's carbohydrates far more than calories that count. I know that's what's in my head now since I've been doing this. By the time this new reflex is installed in your subconscious, you'll have shed pounds and years of tiredness, whatever your age, you'll be, uh, you'll begin to feel like a person reborn. But changing reflexes takes time, new knowledge and open mindedness. Are you ready? First, let's review what we know briefly and then look at some of the new evidence. All right, I'm going to close my door over here. Sorry about that. That's a little better. It's so beautiful out, I wanted the door open, but I guess not. <laughs> All right. Even the medical profession admits that low-calorie diets haven't worked. We've all been exposed to a great number of reducing diets, but there are really only two basic calorie categories. <laughs> I could read. Those that depend on reducing the total intake of calories and those that depend on the reduction of carbohydrate intake, where calories needn't be counted. The balanced low-calorie diet has been the medical fashion for so long that to suggest any alternative invites professional excommunication. Yet even most doctors admit, at least privately, the, the ineffectiveness of low-calorie diets, balanced or unbalanced, it is, so, it is also admitted in the medical press. In a comprehensive review of 30 years of medical literature, two Philadelphia doctors, A.J. Stunkard and M. McLaren Hume, observed that most attempts to control overweight have been ineffectual. The low-calorie balanced diet is theoretically a lifetime diet, but only theoretically. The public has been exposed to a barrage of medical and popular propaganda 
on its virtues for 60 years. The public read, listened, tried it again and again and again with and without medical supervision. After 60 years of calorie counting, 60% are still worrying about overweight. Nonetheless, sorry, nevertheless, as numerous studies and polls have shown, 60% of our adult population is still, quite rightly, worrying about overweight. No studies based on a balanced low calorie diet have ever shown better than a 2% long-term success rate. There's the pragmatic proof that balanced or unbalanced low calorie diets don't work. On imprisoned laboratory rats, yes. On hungry free living humans, no. Well, we may not we may be a lot like rats, but we're still different. So, you know, it is kind of silly to depend on the rats all the time for all our medical testing. Can you count the reasons why low calorie diets don't work? We know that low calorie diets don't touch the primary cause of most overweight, disturbed carbohydrate metabolism. Lower energy output. Another reason why low calorie diets fail to work is that the dieter adjusts to the low calorie intake with a proportionate decrease in total energy output. Dr. George Bray of Tufts University School of Medicine has demonstrated that people on low calorie diets actually develop lower total body energy requirements and thus burn fewer calories. The longer they remain on a low calorie diet, the lower uh, becomes their basal metabolism and the less they lose until eventually the low calorie diet may stop working. Well, that makes sense because our bodies were created that if we have a lack of food supply that we can survive, our bodies naturally adjust to that. So that does make sense to me. The third reason, unless you take pills, you're always hungry. But the main reason low calorie diets fail in the long run is because you go hungry on them. In order to get your weight down, you must cut your calories to a point where you don't feel comfortable. And while you may tolerate hunger for a short time, you can't tolerate hunger all your life. When your guard is down, perhaps because you're upset or depressed, you're going to seek the oldest, easiest, most reliable of solaces, food. So naturally, you gain the weight back again. And if you go to a doctor to be treated for overweight, what do you get? A low calorie diet, the same old treatment. You may also get with it a box of confetti colored diet pills, appetite suppressants, amphetamines, basically sometimes with addictions. Uh, no doctor can make starving tolerable. The reason the appetite killing amphetamines have uh, have been dispensed with such a lavish hand is that no doctor can make hunger bearable. So the pills are handed out to bridge the gulf between the patient's natural appetite and the inadequate diet prescribed by the doctor. Yet the starvation diet is only is the only prescription the calorie doctors have had to pass out. You get the diet list, a sheet of calorie counts, a couple of suggested menus, and a pep talk. No matter how effective the pep talk, the message is the same. Eat less than the quantity of food that you're, you found natural and comfortable all these years. That is, a very, that is very easy advice to give, but it's like telling your kid's sister to swim the English Channel. The advice is not at all easy to follow. And I think the fault here lies with the physician in asking his patient to do something that he probably can't do himself. If somebody gave me the project of trying to follow the 1200 calorie diet, I'd cry. Have you ever noticed, this is going to be terrible, but a lot of doctors are overweight themselves and then they tell us to lose weight. <laughs> it's kind of comical, but that, to me is proof right there that 
if they can't follow it, then why should we follow the diet that they're prescribing? <laughs> but there are a lot of doctors now that are coming around to the low carb. Uh, I, the doctor that I see, she was all, when I mentioned it, she was all about the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the low carb diet, keto or Atkins, which Atkins is keto, but you know, a little bit of difference here and there. But yeah, she really was happy to hear that I was doing Atkins when I told her at first. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> excuse me. Why amphetamines can't help you lose weight? Why don't they work? In the main, because there is a tolerance to their effect after a few weeks. This may be because they require a reserve supply of adrenaline in the body in order to be effective, and this supply becomes exhausted after a brief interval. Also, it has been re been re bleh, 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 sorry. <laughs> also, it has recently been demonstrated that amphetamines cause a gradual week by week increase in the levels of circulating insulin. Now, if insulin prevents your fat stores from breaking down, how can that help you lose weight? At any rate, all human and animal studies alike show that upon discontinuance of amphetamines, the body weight goes back to a point above the starting level. Patients like to upset, or I'm sorry, uh, patients like to explain their weight rebound on psychological factors. I got upset and started eating compulsively again. But how do you explain the overgain in laboratory animals living under controlled conditions who gained when amphetamines were withdrawn? Overgain upon withdrawal is the expected effect of diet pill usage. It occurs in all mammals. Diet pills are really appetite postponers. The freedom from hunger they buy will have to be paid back later. And the longer they are used, the greater will be the repayment. Yet patients still come to me asking me for something to curb my appetite. And thousands don't come to me because they know I won't prescribe diet pills. My reply is, why should we curb your appetite? You have a lifelong weight problem and you must learn at some point in your life to work with your own natural biologic urges, such as your appetite. How can you begin to learn if your appetite is suppressed unnaturally by a drug? A very different story from the natural decrease in hunger that goes with the lifelong diet in this book. Thus, the claim that amphetamines are useful for retraining eating habits is shown for what it really is, a gross deception, a deception that has led amphetamines to become uh, to becoming, in the words of Dr. George R. Edison, writing in the Annals of Internal Medicine in 1971, perhaps the most serious drug of abuse in the United States, and no less a menace than heroin. I get a drink. Yeah, I was just thinking as I was reading that, that it's a lot like... Uh, I know they don't do drug, the uh, diet pills so much anymore because they found so many bad things about them. But, <clears throat> but uh, I was just thinking how it does sound a lot like a drug addiction because I know I've explained before how I heard this where you start out here and then as you're drinking, you go up here or doing drugs, same thing. And then after you uh, come off your high, you go down here, then you need the drugs to get back up to the normal level. And this is the same thing. I mean, it's, it's just a drug. Any drug can do those crazy things to you. Our bodies start to depend on it. And I hate to say this because I'm on antidepressants myself, uh, anti-anxieties more specifically, but even being on a medication like that can do the same thing. Your body starts depending on the medication and can't produce what it naturally is supposed to. So that's why I have to keep going back to the anti-anxieties because my body doesn't know how to operate anymore since I was on them so long. 
but I will quit with that. That's only my opinion. <laughs> All right. Now, where was I? Oh, yes. Amphetamine addiction, cost of the calorie dogma. As you have gathered, I don't believe that there is any place for amphetamines in the treatment of overweight. As a side effect, they make your heart beat faster, raise your blood pressure, and have been accused of speeding up the aging process. I have personally observed that they leave profound hypoglycemia in their, we in their wake. They have been responsible for many cases of serious mental illness and even death. They recently have implicated in the epidemic of strokes in young people. The depression that follows their use is one of the leading causes of suicide in our culture. The Food and Drug Administration should have taken them off the market a long time ago. Never has any drug been allowed to exist with such a high incidence of abuse relative to use. When the internal, or sorry, in International Narcotic Enforcement Officers Association asked me to address their Albany Convention in 1971, I recommended to them that the manufacture of amphetamines be totally prohibited. The calorie dogma got them off, uh, off to fame and has kept them there. Most amphetamines get into the hands of the public to be misused because somewhere along the line, a doctor has prescribed them to allay the hunger that goes with the low-calorie diet he hands the patient. Yeah, I don't think they do this so much anymore. This was written in 1972, but I remember growing up in, in the 80s, you'd see TV ads all the time for all these pills, and you'd walk into the, the store and see just a full shelf of all these different diet pills. It was sickening. I haven't really noticed that anymore, but... I know there's some that still do exist. <clears throat> Let's see, where was I? Oh yeah. Why are they still prescribed? Dr. Edison sees many reasons. One is the economic benefits of their sale. Another may be because physicians themselves use these pills more often than the general population. Also, he opines because both doctor and patient sense without verbalizing that they are dealing with a problem that is nearly untreatable in traditional terms. By traditional terms, of course, he means that by treatment with a low calorie diet. But as I said earlier, even with the pills, low calorie diets don't take weight off permanently. Beatrice Goodman is a typical of hundreds of my patients who are cases in point. She has been taking pills since she was nine. Beatrice Goodman is a pretty blonde woman who now looks a good 10 years younger than her age. She had been taking diet pills since she was a fat nine-year-old, 80% of her life. At 14, at her present height of five feet, one inch, she weighed 145 pounds. And in spite of the pills, she has weighed within 20 pounds of that, up or down, most of her life since. Never had she succeeded in getting her weight down to what it should be. She once told me, The first time I came, Dr. Atkins, I overheard you tell your nurse, she won't be back. You thought I wouldn't stick with a doctor who wouldn't give me pills after so many years of taking them. But I found the diet really very painless right from the beginning. A typical yo-yo dieter. Beatrice's weight has always fluctuated widely. I would lose 30 pounds on the pills in a couple of months, she said. Then I'd be put on maintenance, start eating a little more food, and that would be the finish. I could put on 10 or 15 pounds in a week. I don't drink. Bread was my worst thing. And I'm a snacker. I'd eat everything in sight if I was upset. And when I saw thin people with good figures, I'd get upset. Now I don't get upset. I'm happy with me. From size 18 to 8, without pills. She came to me in October 1969, weighing 166 pounds and wearing a size 18. 
Her mother was diabetic and her glucose tolerance test revealed that she had hypoglycemia. On this metabolic diet program, she has lost steadily without pause. Beatrice now wears a size eight and is still losing at the rate of about a pound a month. Earlier, it was around a pound a week. My face was like a moon, she recalls. I had two chins and my complexion used to, used to be awfully dry. In the winter, especially, my hands would get so cracked they hurt. My skin isn't dry now, and I think it's because I eat plenty of fat, which I couldn't before. If I ate lobster, I couldn't eat the butter sauce. I wasn't hungry for a minute, but on this diet, you have to eat. Uh, you have so much to eat, Beatrice said. The first week, I lost four and three fourths pounds, more than I had been losing on the pills. Yet I got so much food, I wasn't hungry for a minute. All my eating habits have changed. In fact, I can't imagine eating any other way. I even think my neck has gotten longer. I suppose it's because it's thinner. But the best part is I'll never, is I know I'll never have to go hungry again. Some of you will read this story and believe it. And yet, because your own calorie conditioning has gone on for so long, you will think, I know that pills are bad. But after all, isn't it absolutely proved that you can only lose weight if you take in fewer calories than you burn up? I can only say to you, it is anything but proved. The calorie theory has become one colossal hoax with which commercial interests and the nutrition establishment have been successfully victimizing the hungry dieting public for too long. Why is the idea of calories so much a part of our dietary thinking and how can it be so wrong? We all know someone thin who eats like a horse and someone fat who eats like a bird. Contrary to the popular misconception, it is a probable it is probable that overweight people actually do eat less than people who have no trouble staying at a normal weight. Every study on food intake of overweight people compared to normals confirms this. Dr. M. L. Johnson, Dr. B. S. Burke, and Dr. Jean Mayer showed this with overweight adolescent girls in Boston. I never understood the calorie thing. I could never count calories. I mean, how are you supposed to measure a calorie? It's not something you can see, you know? That was always my struggle. That I can see if I eat a piece of real bread, that that is going to be a carbohydrate. I can see if I have a sugary, sweet candy bar, that's going to be bad. So that's where my brain is. I don't know about you, but... I guess I'm better with calculating what I see I'm doing. I don't know. <laughs> Fat girls ate 25% less and gained on it. In the Berkeley, California school system, Ruth L. Huneman followed the daily calorie intake of 950 teenagers from the 9th to the 12th grades. She took body measurements of each and she took careful dietary histories. This is what she reported early in 1968. The average calorie intake for all ninth grade boys who weren't overweight was 3,000 calories per day. For similar girls, it was 2,060 calories per day. But the average calorie intake of the overweight boys was only 2,360 calories per day. And the fat girls, I hate when they say that, <laughs> only took in an average of 1,530 calories a day. In the three years the study covered, there were no significant changes in the permanent, sorry, percentage of overweight and non-overweight students. But there was one very sad and important change. In spite of eating less during this three years, both fat boys and fat girls got fatter. My own experience confirms these studies. I have had thousands of overweight patients who habitually 
eat as little or less than their normal weight friends. In my experience, this group outnumbers the patients who overeat. So stop believing this calorie gospel. Start asking questions about the sacred cow, the calorie. What is a calorie? The calorie is a unit of heat or energy. Just as inches are units of length, calories measure the amount of heat and therefore energy a particular food or drink will provide. Specifically, it is the amount of energy required to raise the temperature of one gram of water from zero to, uh, to one degree centigrade. Multiply by a thousand and you have a kilocalorie or the calorie as we know it today. So that's where I'm like, how can you measure heat? <laughs> that's just nuts. But anyway, that's what they do. Calories outside the body can be measured uh, uh, accurately. The calorie theory has held sway for almost two centuries, ever since the renowned French physicist Antoine uh, Lavasseur <laughs> formulated his laws of thermodynamics. Heat energy cannot be created from nothing, he stated. The medical men from that day on adapted this to read calories in equal calories in equal calories out. Otherwise, weight gain or loss must take place. As early as 1760, Joseph Black had devised a calorie meter, an apparatus for measuring those energy units. So when you read on the label of a bottle of diet soda that it contains one calorie, you can believe it. But what about the other part of the calorie balance sheet? How about the calories your body burns up? Just how are they measured? They are not measured directly. They are measured by inference. The only measurable data are the amount of oxygen the body uses. How much carbon dioxide is expended changes in body temperature and so forth. Using a fixed formula, your calor caloric output, the amount of heat energy you use ordinarily can be calculated, provided all other factors are kept constant. One of the items kept constant is the composition of the diet. In other words, diets of different composition were never tested. Yet this is the basis of the calorie dogma. Well, it may be dogma, but it isn't very accurate. You've just been reading about a few of the many studies that suggest this, studies that have shown the contrary to the common medical, impre uh, common medical impression. It happens more often than not that overweight people eat significantly fewer calories than non-overweight controls and yet do not lose and sometimes even gain weight. It isn't how many calories, but the kind of calories that count. It was not until 30 years after the Newborough and Johnson studies were made that two English researchers, Keckwick and Pawan, demonstrated that while people lost weight on a 1,000 calorie a day diet of protein or fat, no weight was lost on a 1,000 calorie a day diet of carbohydrates. My own observations excuse me, have been made so more, can have been much more dramatic. It has been my clinical experience over the years with patient after patient that weight will be lost even when the calories taken in far exceed the calories extended, provided the patient stays under his critical carbohydrate level. Yes, you can lose and lose a lot while overeating. Let's look at the mathematics in the case of Herb Wallowitz. For his whole case history, see chapter 9. Coming up next week, I guess. <laughs> in 17 weeks, Herb lost 85 pounds, and all this while he was eating 3,000 calories a day. This is not a short-term loss. Now for, for the mathematics. If Herb loses 5 pounds a week, and if one pound of fat represents 3,500 calories, then five times 3,500 is 17,500 calories a week, 2,500 calories a day. 
In order to explain this phenomenon using the calorie theory, Herb would have to burn up 3,000 plus 2,500 calories or 5,500 calories a day. But Herb was a normal basal metabolism and a sedentary job as a real estate broker. The most liberal estimate of his caloric uh, expenditure could not exceed 3,000 calories a day. Where are the 2,500 calories a day going? Bear in mind that Herb had gained weight, got up to 367 pounds with the same metabolism and without eating more than 3,000 calories a day. And he received no medications while he lost that 85 pounds, nor was he physically more active while he lost that weight. The key to the calorie fallout. Fallacy. I have been, I have seen similar calorie discrepancies in at least a thousand different patients. So I know the calorie theory is wrong. For years, I have been trying to find out why. I have been scrutinizing the basic premises of the calorie in balances the calorie out misconception. And these are the conclusions to which I have come. Uh, the, cal the calculation of calorie outflow is based on the assumption that fat, as it is burned in the body, is completely degraded, biochemically broken down, to yield all the potential heat energy that it contains. The end products are the basic substances, carbon dioxide and water. If any portion of the fat molecule were to leave the body, in another form containing potential energy, the calorie theory would be proved wrong. We already know about our wonderful friends, those ketone bodies and how they are being excreted in the urine. We measure them with our turning purple sticks. Dr. Keckwick and Dr. Pawan in their pioneering research were the first to point out that a significant amount of latent energy is excreted, excreted in this form. On a low cal carbohydrate diet, nearly three times as much energy is lost in the urine and stools, mainly in ketones, as on a high carbohydrate diet. And as you have read, the ketone calories lost in the urine are just a part of the good news. A significant amount of ketone bodies are also excreted by the way uh, of the air we breathe so that even more ketone bodies are excreted in merely breathing than Keckwick and Pawan accounted for in their study. This is just crazy. I mean, going back to where he was talking about the calories being figured, you know, you can figure out how many go into your body, but every body is different. How can you figure how many calories a body will break down? That's, I don't, I think the human body is way more complex than what we can figure out through mathematics. <laughs> oh man. This diet revolution calorie theory. No studies have been done to demonstrate the complete reason why one can eat all he wants and still lose weight. These studies should be done now. And when they are, the old calorie theory surely will be dead. And the new one will read, calories in equals calories used plus calories excreted unused. Then we can go about our business of extending the diet revolution right past the protests of the nutrition old guard. I think the old guard is beginning to weaken now. Nutrition Reviews, which is sponsored in large part by manufacturers of refined carbohydrates, asked Professor D. A. T. Southgate of Cambridge, England, and one of the world's foremost authorities on calories, to write an original article for it. His conclusion Over the last few years, evidence from a number of sources has accumulated showing that the simple calculation of metabolic. Uh, metabolic energy from a diet is inadequate to account for observations on energy balances and body weight changes. 
he states that there is definite evidence that it is the relative proportions of protein, fat, and carbohydrate in the diet that determine the calorie outflow. But most doctors and most of the public are still victims of the old calorie hoax. The calorie hoax. I think a cruel hoax is being per perpetuated on the public by making us believe that we have no alternative but to believe in the calorie theory. As a result, people are being forced in the conclusion that the wrong diet, the balanced low calorie diet, is really the best diet for them. Because of motivation and their determination, they can lose weight temporarily. But biochemically, cutting calories has always been a cruelty inefficient way to lose weight, even temporarily. Because the carbohydrates in the balanced low calorie diet not only keep you from burning your own fat, but they create hunger as well. Every week, five or six people tell me that they've never been able to stay on a low calorie diet, balanced diet for more than a few days. Well, that's natural. Each of the case histories that follow is typical of a hundred similar stories. Okay, get a drink. But yeah, it's just, man, just the idea that they ha thought that a one-size-fits-all diet would help anybody. And there's no evidence that it was working. So why didn't they come up with something better? <laughs> oh, man. Victims of the cholery hoax. Susie has a pretty face, but is very much overweight. She joins a weight lo losing club where people are applauded if they lose and sometimes booed if they gain. That's sad. Susie follows the diet that they prescribe, a balanced low calorie diet. She doesn't like skim milk, but she drinks it. She eats more fruit than she is accustomed to. And because the diet actually insists on more food on carbohydrates than she had cut down to, she gains weight. When she confesses this at the club, somebody boos her. Susie doesn't cry, but her heart is heavy with discouragement. Susie is a victim of the calorie hoax. That's sad. That's not helpful. The yo-yo victim. Henry w was a fat boy, and now he is a fat man. His self-confidence is shot. He knows he must take a stand, so he goes on a diet. He cuts his quantities way down. He is hungry all the time, but stoically, he ignores it. He must get rid of the fat. Finally, after weeks of hunger, he can't stand it. He begins to eat like a maniac. Every year, he goes through the same shameful, painful ordeal. And every year, he gains back more than he lost. Henry is a victim of the calorie hoax. The model dieter. Gladys does everything right. She eats diet bread, diet desserts, diet cottage cheese, diet fruit, diet candy. She drinks only diet drinks. She cuts every corner. She seldom does anything that seems to be wrong. But Gladys is still a size 16 and all her friends are a size 8. Gladys is a victim of the, fat, of the calorie hoax. The classic victim. Marty asks his doctor, why am I fat? I really don't eat that much. The doctor explains to him very patiently, if you would only eat less than you burn up, you wouldn't be fat. The fact that you are fat implies that you're not really telling us the truth because it's not really possible for you to eat the quantity you say you do and still be so much overweight. Marty is a classic victim of the calorie hoax. What misconception is hoaxing these people? The misconception that one must just eat less rather than differently in order to lose weight. The mistaken belief that the number of calories we take in explains differences in body weight. If calorie counting was the solution to the overweight problem, we wouldn't have so much of it 
because we're a very calorie-wise nation. We know how to count calories, and we know how to cut them. Everyone is trying to sell us on a happy way of feeling hungry, but we just don't want to go hungry. You can lose without hunger or pills. There are a lot of ways of serving food attractively on a low calorie diet, but the quantity that feels right inside your belly is something else. Because in, uh, because in point of biological fact, the foods that produce the sensation of satiety um, just don't get into the diet or bloodstream. It isn't necessary to go hungry to lose. Take the case of a well-known New York economist. He is 5 feet 11 inches and weighed 271 pounds when he came to see me. His blood pressure was high. He had hypoglycemia and there was a family history of diabetes and overweight. Over a year's time, his weight has come down to 194. This is lower than it has been since his college years and he's still losing. He found out the calorie books are wrong. My own experience proves that the calorie books are wrong, he says. I'm losing faster on 1,800 calories a day than I was losing on 1,000 calories when I was eating a balanced diet. I know because I've been counting calories for 20 years. It's hard work to get down to 1,000 calories a day, but I had to. Some people were losing on 1,500 calories calories a day, but not me. And I had long ago cut out drinking. To lose 20 pounds took months of torture. I felt starved. I'd go to the gym and lift weights, and the only thing on my mind was food. But I never would experiment with fad diets. I didn't believe in them. I believed the calorie books, that losing was a matter of less input and more output. But if that was right, I should have been losing four pounds a week, and I was only losing two and feeling lousy. When I first heard about your diet, I thought it was a fatty diet. It took me a year to get here with some sense of despair and a tiny hope. The first two weeks, I lost 16 pounds. Get in those earliest days, I'd eat a pound of meat at a sitting then I settled down to losing about two and a half pounds a week, but pretty much month after month. Now he's eating more and losing more. The point in the diet was a waltz compared. Uh, the point is the diet was a waltz compared to the other diets I've been on. There's no question that I'm eating more and losing more, and it's the easiest diet to follow that I know of. For instance. Fat is the last thing you eat on a conventional diet. Not on this. By October, I felt better than in I don't know how many years. Last week, I even stayed up all night playing poker, a typical day's meals. Breakfast, one egg, four slices of bacon, coffee. Lunch, baked oysters, veal piccata, cooked vegetables, salad. Dinner. Filet of sole with butter and no breading. Asparagus with hollandaise salad. Dessert. Zabaglione, not sure what that is, <laughs> made without sugar. Before bed, a slice of brie which, uh, with which he may have some of the 16 ounces of wine he is allowed per week. The anguish basic question is never raised. Very few patients can bring themselves to embarrass the doctor by asking the anguish basic question, why do I get fat when people I eat lunch with do not? We get about the same amount of exercise. We're around the same age. We eat and drink pretty much the same things. There's very little that a hardcore calorie counting doctor can say about the, that stubborn riddle. He knows from his practice that all those patients who make these claims aren't lying or deluded. He's probably aware if one patient is overweight, there's a 40% chance of overweight in the child. In both parent 
if both parents are overweight, there's an 80 to 90% chance the child will be overweight too. He sees that the calorie theory doesn't fit real life, but he is stuck with it. He needn't be. Are some born fat prone? Doctors who sat in on the round table on overweight at the convention of the, uh, of the American College of Physicians in Philadelphia a couple of years ago heard that some people simply have more fat cells than others, frequently from babyhood. These excess fat cells are lifelong installations. They create hunger, though why and how isn't fully understood. And their presence heralds the metabolic uh, disorder that contain contri that contributes to making uh, an individual even more overweight prone. On a calorie counting regime, hunger makes a permanent weight loss virtually impossible. Only on a hunger-free diet can the fat-prone uh, hope to lose. Gram counting is easier, but different. Because we've been brainwashed for so long, you'll have to be on guard all the time. But I know it can be done. You'll get a lot of static at first as you switch from counting calories to counting grams. You explain to a friend that you're counting carbohydrates now, not calories. And you explain the new regime. But she is still going to say, Oh, but surely you can have carrot sticks. No calories in those. Or what? You can't have grapefruit or ketchup or skim milk. So then you explain, or you don't, that because you're eating differently, it is not calories that you count, but carbohydrates. And that some low calorie foods are loaded with carbohydrate and some high calorie foods have none. Like butter and mayonnaise and pastrami and spare ribs and roast duckling and after you've explained she is still going to say here's extra lemon for your lobster dear i know you won't take the butter sauce well she's only trying to help she can't because she has been brainwashed so have we all when she hears the word diet she is locked into calorie count reflex i'm writing this book to unbrainwash you I want to change your mental and emotional reflexes about calories, about calories too. If I succeed, your diet troubles are over. And that's the end of that chapter. Yeah, it's just crazy how we've been stuck on this same system of dieting for centuries, basically. And the world is still stuck on it. Whenever you tell someone you're on a low carb diet, they just kind of, they laugh at you behind your back or they look at you funny or something. Once in a while, you'll find someone, hold on, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, once in a while, you'll find someone that is intrigued and they'll actually ask you about it. And sometimes you'll find someone that's really interested and they may not follow it because they don't need to. Maybe they're a uh, normal weight person, but sometimes I do find someone that they know that I'm on low carb and they'll ask me questions and things like, what can you eat? What do you, can you not eat? Things like that. And you know, that's a funny thing because People say, oh, low carb is bad because you're so restricted. What is low calorie diet? <laughs> That's more restrictive than low carb. And, you know, I get to enjoy a lot of things. Like I get to have my iced coffee with heavy cream. Not the, I mean, you can have half and half. It's hard for me in my little town to find any good heavy cream because, uh, I don't know if you know this, but there's an ingredient called carrageenan. And you can look it up because I have. And I discovered that carrageenan is actually used in test studies, like with scientists and such, 
where they will uh, give the patients this carrageenan to make them gain weight so that they can test something. And so then why do they put it in our products? That's, yeah, so I stay away. Usually I have to end up getting organic cream just because that's the only ones I can find that don't have the carrageenan in them. And there was only one brand here in my little town that was being sold. And now both grocery stores stopped carrying it. One is Walmart. The other is the local grocery store. So I'm going to have to contact them and the little grocery store and see if they'll start carrying it again. But at any rate, um, sorry, I got off track there. <laughs> but yeah, it's just... It's crazy to think that after all these centuries, people are still doing the same thing. They're thinking the same way. This is 2021. How can we not be converting our ideas by now? And this was written in 1972. And there were many other doctors and medical professionals that had done studies before him. And why is this not? taking off and being the main thing that doctors talk about. That's what I don't get, but whatever. It is what it is. As long as we can access the information and as long as we can do best for ourselves, that's all that really matters. And the rest of the people, if they don't want to listen, that's their choice. We all have a choice. You know, that's our right in this country to have the freedom to make our own choices. And so it is what it is. So I will keep doing my best that I can do. I'm trying to get back on track again. And I hope this little refresher will help you. Um, yeah, my husband went to the emergency room for his back again. He has back spasms. And we went in on Monday to recheck him. And he said the reason the back spasms are happening is he's got discs that are slipping out. The muscles are protecting it. And how they are reacting, for whatever reason, is they spasm so that they can keep the back in place. Well, the core muscles will help hold the back in place as well. But when you're overweight, the core muscles don't do too much good because they're surrounded by so much fat. And he's got a big belly. So he's trying to cut down on different things. So hopefully I can help him, you know, when I cook dinner at home. And, and when he's at work, he's trying to eat a little better. And he does like to walk to work, so that's a little bit of exercise he's getting. And so hopefully we'll be doing this more together. But at any rate, that's all I really have to say today. So I will see you next time. You have a wonderful week. Join the journey.